Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to you, Lindsay, for such a wonderful and warm welcome. Really very grateful for that. I am conscious of the honor that the Maxim Institute has conferred upon me when they asked me to deliver this year's Sir John Graham Lecture. I am privileged to have the opportunity to follow in the footsteps of speakers who have participated in this annual event that honors the memory of Sir John Graham. I was a young adult and university student during a period that came to be known in South Africa as the turbulent 1980s. And so for me, being here tonight is a symbol of the connection between our struggle for freedom and dignity in a country where black people were considered second-class citizens in the land of their ancestors and the struggle of the Maori for dignity and equality in the land of their birth and home of their ancestors. It is heartwarming to see the generation after Sir John Graham following on his footsteps leading these conversations that have brought us together this evening with such elegance, grace, and dignity. When Sir John Graham visited South Africa with the All Blacks in 1960, he returned to his country to bear witness to the suffering of black people under apartheid. Yet his concern for the spectacular oppression of black South Africans by the apartheid government did not blind him to the marginalization of Maori, his own country women and men, their families and their communities. 1981, the year of the so-called flower bomb and barbed wire rugby tour, a struggle and yours although not many of us knew at the time, were inextricably linked by a quest for justice to reclaim our dignity in the aftermath, or as some would say, in the afterlife of colonialism in our countries. Sir John knew that the 1981 anti-Springbok tour protests were not, should not be just about rugby. And he said as much and cautioned that, quote unquote, this obsession with rugby may shift the gaze away from the care and concern about issues of social justice and the problem of racism on home ground. Watching and listening to the Auckland Grammar Boys rendition of the Haka on YouTube performed with such emotion and virtuosity at his funeral, evoked memories of those turbulent years in South Africa. The faces of those boys, in all their diversity, were such a force of beauty and affirmation of a people's history and culture. After watching this movement of bodies that heaved and sighed and pumped with force of unity of spirit, the feeling that this evokes in me lingered for most of the night and into the next day. I was reminded that these moments, so pregnant with powerful symbolism, confront one with feelings that one may not even have the vocabulary to express. Yet they explode and break open a different kind of voice, precisely because of their symbolism. A voice that speaks to the recognition, even healing of pain and suffering endured over so many generations into the present. This voice issues out in the tradition of a call and response, speaking and being heard reminding us that the call to repair the past should be renewed every day with each generation that carries memories 
of a past not lived, yet remembered, and that symbols matter in the quest for the repair of the brokenness of the past. In a way, he more his singing of God defend New Zealand in her native Maori on the stage of World Cup rugby in 1999 was a call for recognition. The response to that call, no matter that it followed after heated debates, is testimony to the powerful force of the potential for change. And so, in responding to the invitation to address you this evening on this title that unfolded from conversations with Alex and his team at Maxim Institute, I draw from the tradition of storytelling to share with you unique historical moments that have been illuminating. These stories are less from the great philosophers and religious or political theories than from ordinary people who themselves have suffered irreparably. The lessons from these historical moments show that there is something to learn about what is possible in human behavior in the aftermath of systemic oppression, genocide, and mass political violence. I know that today my country faces something of a crossroads. It is a time of extraordinary upheaval in our country and the world, created in large part by irresponsible leadership and the greed and runaway corruption that it has produced. My country is haunted by this post-apartheid predicament the brutality of corruption that has allowed the continuing exclusion of millions of South Africans from the full enjoyment of hard-worn rights and promised of a better life for all. Dreams have been squandered and destinies derailed by the rampant corruption that reached unimaginable heights during the last decade. Therefore, I am not blind to the problems we face in my country. My presentation tonight is motivated by my sense of hope and belief that if the level of depravity that has been captured most compellingly with the phrase, the banality of evil, is fostered in an environment in which inhumanity against others thrives, then it should be possible that relationships that foster thoughtfulness and care and the sense of being human reproduce themselves in our relational world. I begin, therefore, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC of South Africa, that shining moment in our history whose enduring lessons about what's possible in the aftermath of so much tragedy still shine a bright memory in my mind, having served as chair of the TRC's Human Rights Violations Committee in the Western Cape region. My reflection is on the TRC's mo most visible aspects, the public hearings, and then other relationships and events that emerge from that public process. I want to begin by inviting you to listen to a minute-long audio clip. The clip begins with one of those symbolic moments that played out at the public hearings of the TRC, the iconic scream of a widow who testified at the opening of the TRC's public hearings about the killing of her husband by the apartheid police. His body with his three comrades was found in the outskirts of a town called Port Elizabeth. Chad burnt with his car. They were stabbed by police, white security police. 
and left uh, to burn in this uh, open field. They were discovered days later. And so this is her voice that you got, the widow, one of the widows of these men. The clip ends, the clip that you're going to hear ends, or rather begins again with a response by a white South African music composer who transforms the voice into music. The performance of his music itself a call to empathy for the suffering of the other. No Monde Kalata. At the opening of the public hearings of the TRC, the large city hall in the South African city of East London that you see on the screen was capacity full, all black, with the white TRC commissioners and some reporters, the only visible white people in the audience. When the audience rose to sing a song that was at once a poem and an anthem of black pain, sung throughout the years of apartheid repression by black people at mass funerals, political rallies, and peaceful process, the song, Liza Lisi Dingala Kongosi, Fulfill Thy Promise, Lord, reverberated into the large hall, carrying the hope that the moment promised. This was the same moment into which Norman de Kalata screamed her pain, daring to give voice to it and bearing witness for all to hear beyond the walls of the public hearings. Imagine that, a piercing scream that seemed to shatter the magnificent walls of the East London City Hall a structure built in colonial times to celebrate Queen Victoria's jubilee, Diamond Jubilee. The building still housed memorial plaques for some of the fallen British soldiers when the British and the Afrikaners fought to take over South Africa. Reflecting on this scene at the time, surrounded by the walls that harken back to an earlier generational time, it seemed to me that this wailing cry with the violent movement of Mrs. Kalata's body thrown back as she was screaming out her pain, she was moving back and forth in her body, that this violent scream and the body movement might be captured and interpreted in one's imagination as a moment that represents at once an expression of anger and pain screamed at a past that goes back several generations. Her body seemed to carry the haunting weight of this past, seemingly expunging it into the TRC's public space communal remembering. South African musician Philip Miller then resurrects this wailing voice from the archives of the TRC's narratives producing the music cry that you heard earlier in the audio clip. One of South Africa's celebrated soloist's iconic voice then picks up Mrs. Kalata's crying voice and represents it through her magnificent and electrifying mezzo-soprano. Later in the song, several other voices emerge and merge into a choir, producing a chorus of collective voices, 
all bearing witness to this human cry and call for recognition of end of and response to her pain. And as if this was the thoughts on Archbishop Tutu's mind, as silence hovered over and covered the hall with a piercing reverberation of Mrs. Talato's cry, the only sound to be heard, the gentle interruption by Archbishop Tutu with the song, Senzenina, what have we done? Itself a wailing cry of black pain. The moment brought together two generations of struggle for dignity and human rights, the struggle against humiliation by the Archbishop Tutu's generation and Nomon de Talata's generation. The song spoke to the collective memory of trauma and pain reenacted here in this scene that seems to carry the narrative through the silence of words as well as through the body. Tutu, Archbishop Tutu here and the audience's response in song bear witness to this testimony, acknowledging it in order to validate the reality of her experience and connecting it to the collective experience of others present and those no longer present. For Philip Miller, as a white South African response, his work seeks to take us beyond thinking about guilt and shame into the terrain of direct engagement with and confronting the past. The story should be told, he seems to be saying with his production, reflected upon instead of denied. The denial of history is an urgent problem in post-apartheid South African society. And this denial came in many guises. When I served on the TRC, I designed the Commission's outreach program, which set out how the TRC's work would be organized, how testimonies would be collected, and how public hearings would be conducted. Many people criticized us and argued that the TRC process would, quote unquote, open wounds and, quote, re-victimize survivors. In other words, they were trying to silence the process. These stories should not be heard. While there is some truth in this argument, the promise, the premise on which it is based, however, is erroneous on two grounds. First, it assumes that the trauma is in the past, gone and forgotten. So we should let sleeping dogs lie. Second, silence, in this case, the absence of a possibility to speak about one's trauma and one's people's trauma is assumed to make closure possible. Thus, we should thread softly around these ghosts of the past, lest we awaken them. Yet, repeatedly, some victims and survivors of trauma and generations of their descendants who come after cry out for public acknowledgement of their direct or, in the case of descendants, inherited pain and suffering. For instance, Norman de Calata, whose scream we heard earlier on tape, was asked by Philip Miller how she felt about hearing her voice in the music he created. She replied that her iconic cry, which the South African poet Anki Kroch has referred to as the signature tune of the TRC, was for her a living memorial to her loving husband. Transforming the scream into music honored the memory of her husband, she said. And this, quote, felt like a soothing balm, unquote, 
in her trauma. Here is another example of a story that shows that this idea that the re-victimization and the re-traumatization of people's past pain should lead to a silencing of the such pain is a fallacy. When we launched the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's outreach prog program, we traveled the country and we went into community halls and various spaces to announce the coming of the process of the TRC. At one of these events, just as I was presenting the work of the TRC, I noticed at the back of the audience that there was a woman who was sitting, who had turned her back to us. She had literally physically turned and turned her chair. She almost as if to say, I don't want to hear what you're talking about. And so when I finished my presentation and my colleagues were, it was my colleagues' turn to speak, I walked down from the passage to the woman at the back. And as I approached, she said she wanted to go home and she left the room and I followed her. And because it started to rain, I offered to drive her to her home. And she let me, let me drive, drive her. And on arriving home, I opened the door for her. And instead of going into the house, she stopped and looked at me and said, would you mind coming in? So I went into this very simple home of hers. And she showed me the chair to sit in the chair. And immediately, she started telling her story about her son who was killed, 11-year-old boy killed during the many massacres of the violent regime of apartheid that stopped peaceful protests in many communities. He came home during school break at 10 o'clock. I was sitting right there where you're sitting just sitting exactly where you are sitting in that chair. He walked in, dressed in his school uniform, and went to the cupboard over there and cut himself a slice of bread. He is doing all of this in a rush. He is like that when he comes home during break. He spread peanut butter on it and then put the rest of the bread back, leaving the crumbs all over the cupboards. And the knife, still smudged with peanut butter, he ran out. He is still chewing his bread and holding it in his hand. In his hand. It wasn't long. I heard shots outside, some commotion, more shots. Then I'm hearing, Ulutando, Ulutando, Mama Gatemba, Nangu Lutando, 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 this is the son's name. Lutando's mother in my community, younger people and even older people refer to women as the mother of so-and-so. And so now she's hearing the call, mother of Lutando. And so she rushes out and she says, I went flying out of this house. Now I am dazed. I ran not thinking my eyes are on the crowd that has gathered. So as the son was returning to school with a slice of bread in his hand, he is shot by the police. The mother's recollection of the events has a visual and dramatic quality to it. A young boy, school uniform, returning to class, holding a slice of bread in his hand, just moments before he's shot and killed. She has to tell the story. Someone has to listen. She wants the interviewer to picture the moment, to witness it as it were. The moment when she was called out by a crowd who witnessed the shooting of her son, listening to this story and others like it, gives one a clear sense of the dangers that young people like Lutango faced, how vulnerable they were during the anti-apartheid struggle and the fear with which parents lived that their children may not return home alive. And so these stories invite us to connect as a mother you have to think, what would I have done if this were my child? And what would I have done had this happened to my child? This is part of the reason, a very strong reason for the telling of these stories. Describing the moment to me as I sat with her in her room 
She recalled the final moments when she arrived at the scene and saw her son's lifeless body. Here is my son, she said, gesturing with her hand towards the kitchen floor. She continued, it was just blood all over. My anguish was beyond anything I ever thought I could experience. They have finished him. I threw myself down on him. I can feel the wetness of his blood. And as she said that she held to her chest, I felt the last breath leave him. The here on the floor that she points at is evocative, was evocative and still is evocative for me. It points to a specific place that resides not only in terms of its physical location there in the streets of the past where a son was killed, but more significantly for her here in its embodied state in her mind. The events recounted cannot be understood to be in the past, but events experienced as in the here of now. That's what trauma does. Thus, from this we may conclude that to suggest that people should forget the past and move on creates great conceptual mischief. The past is an embodied psychic reality for many people whose lives are marked by violence or histories of violence. The, narrative, the narratives that people tell gesture toward the sites of the theater of the original violence, but their recollections also evoke the mental landscapes where the scenes of violence replay in an ending reenactment of the original scenes. In their testimonies, survivors who suffered under apartheid want acknowledgement of their pain, not in order to forget, but rather to reclaim their dignity and the dignity of the living and in respect of the loved ones who, were, who, are, who suffered the dehumanization in life and in death. In this sense, then, the testimonies are not only to get the listeners affirmation and validation. In several, and this is something that one hears in all of the writings about testimonies, that this is the goal of these testimonies. In fact, most of the Holocaust literature speaks about trauma testimonies' goal as a goal to receive validation and affirmation from the listening audience. This formulation of the purpose of trauma testimonies gives power to the listener as the one who, the one to bestow recognition on the survivors and their suffering. If, however, we think of trauma testimonies as victims' assertion of agency and of the dignity of, the, of their own agency and assertion of the dignity of their community, Trauma testimonies can be viewed as seeking and perhaps even demanding a response from listeners. The purpose is in order to rid oneself and the collective memory of one's community of the subject position of the dehumanized other and to rest away from the perpetrators and from the dominant culture the feared power to destroy one's human spirit. Archbishop Tutu aptly called the TRC the third way. It lifted the veil of lies perpetuated under apartheid, offering victims, perpetrators, and implicated others, to borrow Michael Rothbard's term, a language to speak about the horrific past. Confronting perpetrators at TRC hearings created horizon moments that oriented the country toward a future in which it was hoped there would be no longer denial or justification of the past. The truths that emerged were sometimes dramatically revealing and sometimes 
impossible to translate into objective and corroborative evidence that could survive the rigors of law. Take, for instance, the public hearing of the most feared torturer in the Western Cape, that of Jeffrey Benzin, the scene that you see on the screen there. It was one of the most dramatic moments of the TRC. Tony Yengeni, anti-apartheid activist who suffered severe torture and detention, faced Jeffrey Benzin, the most feared police torturer in the Western Cape. Yengeni wanted Benzin to demonstrate how he tortured his victims. He came ready with a friend to act the part of victim and had brought a pillow for Benzin to use as the, as, as, as the wet bag method, as the wet bag that he used to torture his, his, uh, his victims. While stunned commissioners and judges watched the victim, quote unquote victim, lay face down on the TRC floor, hands locked behind his back, and the torturer, Benzin, sitting astride on him, demonstrating how he tortured his victims. We all looked on, wondering what is going to unfold. At this hearing, Tony Hiengeni, sitting across from Benzin, was urging him to show how he did it. And as Benzin performed the reenactment and described his torture method, Yengeni wanted some answers. What kind of a human being does this to another? What kind of a man are you? Yengeni asked, his voice filled with disdain. What kind of man uses a method like this one of the wet bag on other human beings, repeatedly listening to their groans, to those moans and cries and groans? and taking each of those people very near to their deaths. And Benzin responded, also becoming tearful at this moment. And this again is the value of these, of these moments, the confrontation and allowing the perpetrator to go to a place that perhaps he may never have even thought of going deep into their conscience. These are people who dehumanize others, but as we know, before you dehumanize the other, you have to dehumanize the self first. And so these moments were opportunities for perpetrators to reconnect to their own humanity. It can be debated, of course, whether what Yengeni demanded was wholesome, was a way of inviting him to do this, but nonetheless, it is an important moment because it does bring the perpetrator to confronting his own deeds. And so at this point, he now responds and says, in hindsight, I, I see that this was wrong. And as he responds and speaks, even though he's demonstrating the methods of torture, you could see the tears also flowing on his own face. He's now being shown the evil side, the evil side of his identity. And so these moments are opportunity for perpetrators to have a mirror put up and shown at them, this is who you were, this is what you did, these are your deeds. And it's difficult for some people to, although some people do manage to turn the other way and not look at this truth, but for, for many, it becomes difficult not to confront that reality. It forces them to look into the mirror, their dehumanization reflected back at them. Who are these people today in post-apartheid South Africa? And what stories do they tell their children about this shameful history? How are the memories of this shame passed down through reflective engagement with it or through silencing and denial. These are some of the most urgent questions of our time. Few topics stake a more compelling claim on, humani on humanity's research than the legacies of hi historical trauma. Apartheid, 
colonialism, slavery, and other watershed moments of crimes against humanity in the 20th century and earlier centuries are not events in the past. They are a history whose traumatic repercussions reverberate across multiple generations. Not all perpetrators rose to the challenge of truth telling. For example, the apartheid era polit politician Clive Darby Lewis, who was responsible for the assassination of the much loved Chris Hani, the former head of the ANC military wing, when he invoked this, Chris, uh, Clive Darby Lewis assassinated Chris Hani. And Chris Hani, by the way, was also much loved by Nelson Mandela. And many of us believe that Nelson Mandela saw him as his heir apparent. So Clive Darby Lewis, rather than confronting the truth about what he did, he invoked his Christian faith at his TRC public hearings as justification for the killing of Chris Hani. And quotes, we as Christians are told that it is our duty to fight the antichrist in whichever way we can, unquote. In this narrative strategy, expressions of accountability are inverted by simultaneously shifting blame away from the self in order to project it externally, often onto the victim or survivor. Remorse is unlikely to emerge under these conditions. We face these challenges even in the general uh, 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 public where people find it difficult to face their accountability for having benefited for, from these kinds of systems. Yet the dialogic space of the TRC would often engender, despite these stories, it still would engender effective attunement with the victim's burden of historical trauma. In other words, there was a connection, often there was a connection. Instead of a foreboding feeling of disintegration in those who carry the burden of guilt and shame about the past, sometimes a feeling of containment can emerge to enable deeper awareness of the continuing legacy of the past. I was planning not to elaborate on this, but uh, one of the speakers earlier reference to the responsibility of the victim to reach out in an invitation to people who carry guilt and shame inspires me to add a little bit of, uh, of explanation here. And to agree with him that the irony of this, there are two ironies. One irony is that in order for healing to take place, victim need the perpetrator to hold them in, onto the journey, to bring them onto the journey of healing through telling the truth of what happened, through expressions of, of remorse, through a willingness to engage with these parts. That's a paradox because the victim then looks up to the perpetrator to help them with their own healing. The same person was responsible for the pain. The other kind of paradox is that victims themselves, because they are the ones who hold the key to the perpetrator's forgiveness, the perpetrator's re-entry into the, into the world of moral humanity, should carry a kind of generosity of spirit. I call it a burden, but it's a positive burden in that by opening the space for the re-entry of perpetrators and others who benefited from perpetrators' actions, the invitation allows the perpetrator to feel a certain level of safety, that this is not about making you feel guilty and making you feel shameful. Rather, it is about holding your shame and your guilt. It's about providing you the space to confront that shame and guilt so that you can transcend it. Because when victims hold on the badge of victimhood and continue to inflict the suffering 
of the perpetrator, the suffering in the sense of the feeling of guilt and the shame, if victims continue to reinforce this shame and guilt, there is no way of communicating. There is no way of refining one another, of reconnecting with one another. Instead, there is a deepening of the divide. But if victims allow themselves, difficult as it may be, to open up the space for the entry so that the perpetrator falls into the space of containment and gives the other person a feeling of safety and security that I will be held, I will not disintegrate because of confronting my shame and guilt for the evil that I've done, then that gives a sense of hope that in engaging with this past, the person will grow and transcend and become a better person because in the final analysis, that is the goal. The goal is an invitational one. The goal is so that we rebuild, not that we point fingers and destroy and destruct the communities that we want to restore. So now I want to talk about these gestures of reaching out by victims and the image of two people coming from different sides of history. This image of embracing one, a parent, the other, a killer of her child is something from which some may wish to avert their gaze. It is not a straightforward encounter. The complexity of these meetings rarely has fully been explored. And my discussion, which now looking at the time is not gonna be a discussion, has to be very limited. So I will just simply jump quickly to sharing two stories, if I may, please. One, a young South African woman who was five when her mother was killed by Eugene de Kock, the apartheid government chief assassin named Prime Evil. She goes to prison to see him, to hear what her mother's last moments were, what she was wearing, what de Kock remembers of those last moments. And so she's asking him all these questions and she only has one hour and has to leave afterwards. And as she leaves, she leaves him with a book on forgiveness and expresses her forgiveness and leaves. And later on, I invite her to my university to talk about this experience and I ask her the question, what was most memorable for you? at that moment of meeting Eugene de Kock, she describes talking to him and rushing her questions because of time. She says, the table is a narrow table, the prison table. And I had to come close to him. And I was so close that I noticed that our knees were touching. And as I was rushing, look, looking at the time, rushing through the questions, I noticed that our noses were touching and we were breathing the same air. Now, I have a long thing about this breathing the same air, but what I want to say in conclusion, which I know that I have to do now, is that um, when we were welcomed this morning, I was welcome and the Maxim Institute staff accompanied me. There was an enactment of, of exactly this kind of thing, you know, of noses touching and breathing the same air. In my work, I. I, I write about this story as a symbolic idea of exactly how we ought to be to one another, to breathe the same air, to have an invitational stance that allows us to breathe the same air. And so it was clear to me that our cultures are so connected and that here is an example. Here an example, just, at the, just here, as we're living together here, Witnessing this example of what is possible in human relationships, of connecting and breathing the same air. Why is it that we are not drawing on these examples as examples that teach us how to be together in the aftermath of all these tragic stories in our countries? In my country, the word we use is Ubuntu. This idea of connecting is Ubuntu. It is a point where we are invited to witness to one another. It's, it's, it's a community, it's a communal style of living that invites us to be witnesses to one another's stories, to each other's lives and to each other's futures. And 
when we do that, we are really building a sense of strong solidarity with one another. And it is through solidarity with one another that we'll be able to hold hands together and to move forward in the spirit of seeking social justice for all. Thank you.